Thank you for listening to the show on Really Big Something Channel. November 22nd, 2017. Welcome back in, folks. Good to have you with us at 2.05 in the afternoon at the Voice of Boston, WRKO. And we are delighted to be joined by a gentleman who deals with an issue that, I, if I were dealing with it every day the way he does eight hours a day, I'd probably have padded walls and pound the walls repeatedly over some of the nonsense that goes on in this country regarding immigration. And you'll hear about it now from Ira Melman, who's the Director of Media Relations at the Federation for American Immigration Reform. Mr. Melman, happy Thanksgiving, sir. Thanks. Happy Thanksgiving to you, too. And by the way, who says I don't have padded walls? <laughs> well, you're smart if you do, given the subject you deal with. Uh, we'll get to some of that. Starting with Judge William Oreck, so I know where you, go, where you know where I'm going with this. Um, he decided that as a federal district court judge, a low-level judge, uh, that he's going to decide that the President of the United States cannot implement a policy of, uh, and the administration cannot implement a policy of, of uh, holding funds back from sanctuary cities, certain funds, not all funds, but certain funds from the federal government because those sanctuary cities refuse to cooperate on the matter of illegal immigrants needed by ICE to deport them. What about that decision, sir? Well, I mean, first of all, this is part of a strategy that is being employed by the advocates for illegal aliens uh, and obviously also for the sanctuary cities. They find themselves a judge that they know is politically inclined to give them the ruling that they want. And, and their whole intent here is to throw sand in the gears. Uh, you know, I'm not even sure that most of them think they have a credible case. Uh, they just have one that is credible enough for a highly politicized judge to issue an injunction. Uh, and, and, you know, the, what they can do is just sort of drag this out, delay uh, the, in, the administration from implementing its policies for many months, if not years. Uh, but there's absolutely no basis. Uh, you know, the Justice Department uh, has been given this money by Congress. The Congress has said you can distribute it uh, based on whatever criteria or reasonable criteria you see fit. And, you know, the Justice Department has a lot of criteria for giving out these grants, just as every other department does. And, you know, they, it is perfectly reasonable for them to say, look, you know, if you're not going to cooperate in the enforcement of federal immigration law, not only aren't you going to cooperate, but you're actually going to impede it, then you should not be deserving of these Department of Justice grants. And, you know, ultimately, I believe that the, the courts will uphold this, but the problem is, in the meantime, it's kind of dead in the water. I, what I don't understand is the preemption clause in the United States Constitution gives the federal government authority over subject matters that it's responsible for, and any state law that is inconsistent, or municipal law for that matter, that is inconsistent with the federal policy uh, must be extinguished. That's what the Constitution says. I mean, I learned that in law school and studying for four bar exams in four different states repeatedly. So how do they get away with this? Well, right. And, you know, the Supreme Court on countless occasions has come down on that side. But, you know, the, the, the thing is, as I mentioned, you have a highly politicized judge uh, who doesn't particularly care about what the law says or what the Constitution says, and he's just going to use his authority to delay the implementation of a policy by the Department of Justice. So uh, it, it is a political strategy. It's one that is used all the time. And by the way, this is not just a violation of the Constitution. It is a violation of explicit statutory language passed by Congress in 1996, signed into law by President Clinton, that prohibits these sorts of sanctuary policies. It says very clearly, no local law may prohibit government employees or government officials from cooperating with ICE or, or its predecessor, the Immigration and Naturalization Service that existed back then. Uh, so that there is, you know, it, it is right there in the law uh, that these policies are illegal, and yet they persist, and yet you have judges who are going to find some pretense to prevent the federal government from holding them accountable. By the way, just as a parenthetical note, this particular Judge Oreck raised $200,000 for Barack Obama, bundled money, and 100000 for John Kerry. So where do you think he is on this matter? <laughs> well, and, uh, you know, it may be why he is on the bench. It was President Obama who appointed him to the bench. So, uh, you know, I did, 
don't don't want, particularly want to go there, but uh, you know, clearly this guy has uh, a, a political point of view. And look, I mean, everybody's entitled to their political point of views, uh, but when you're a judge, you're supposed to rule on the law and not based on politics. There you go. Well, let's segue from that to a to a specific point about uh, the law you mentioned, the 1996, signed by Bill Clinton, by the way. Uh, sanctuary policies, and this apparently uh, was found out recently that Michael Hancock, the mayor of Denver, has now said by executive order, executive order of the mayor, any city or county employee who talks with U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement could face jail time, fines of up to $999, and possibly even termination. This is a protection of illegal aliens, but what we learned about it from was actually an anonymous employee who sent out a screen capture, he took a picture, I guess, of a slideshow presentation given to city and county workers, and it basically said, unless employees were presented with a warrant from ICE, they could not interact with ICE agents, period, unless they're prepared to do some jail time. Unbelievable. What about that? It, it, I mean, it is it is unbelievable that a, a city will threaten an employee with jail time if he or she cooperates with the federal government. I mean, it, it is it boggles the imagination. Uh, it, you know, even California hasn't thought of that one yet. Uh, I, I guess you know the balls in their court. The, the the bar has been raised now a mile high. Uh, and I, I guess some of these other sanctuary jur- jurisdictions are going to try to catch up. Uh, you know, maybe they're going to, you know, threaten them with execution. I don't know what's next, <laughs> but, you know, it, it is just outrageous. I don't know if this policy has ever been carried out in Denver. I, I doubt it has uh, yet, but, you know, certainly I, I think it would make the – you would have the makings of a, of a good, good lawsuit there. But isn't – isn't what the, the the very point you made about the ninety six law signed by Clinton? Isn't that isn't this order executive order a violation of that law? Yeah, yeah absolutely, it's a violation of that law. Uh, but I mean, it's such an egregious one to actually threaten a government employee with jail time and a criminal record, charging them with a crime uh, because they followed federal law instead of the mayor's politically driven edict. Uh, I mean, it, it's kind of, it boggles the imagination. I mean, where are we headed as a nation when you have all of these individual leaders and communities making their own laws and threatening people uh, with very, very serious consequences if they, if they obey the law instead of obeying their masters? By the way, uh, Denver is also reducing sentences for illegal aliens below what legal people would get in order to keep them off of ICE's radar so that ICE can't get to those people. How about that? I believe in those, um, for those offenses, it applies to everybody, not just illegal aliens. And by the way, it's not, um, it's not just Denver. Uh, I, I know, for instance, Seattle has done this for quite some time, uh, that they have changed the sentencing to get people under the 365-day uh, sentence which would mandate, mandate that they be deported if they're um, right. not U.S. citizens. So this is not the only community, community to have done this. It's prevalent around the country. Uh, I'm sure in many jurisdictions around the country they're doing the same thing. Well, sanctuary city type cities, three, 365 days makes it a felony. That's why they go below that. And if it's a misdemeanor, it's to keep, ICE doesn't get to, to know about them. Um, the lottery. We heard a lot about that, this visa lottery. And the guy who came in and in New York killed, I think it was eight people, uh, driving down the uh, walkway there, the uh, place where people do their jogging. Um, that that was horrific, obviously. He was from Uzbekistan. But now we learn how horrible that lottery system is. Uh, comment about some of these. For example, a guy named Abdurasul Hazanovich Jiraboev. He conspired to provide material support to the Islamic State terrorists only days before the attack by Saipov, the guy who ran down those eight people. Um, this is another guy that got in on the lottery system. Yeah, uh, you know, the if you go back a few years, there was a uh, shooting at LAX at the El Al check-in desk. This was back in 2002, perpetrated by a guy who was an illegal alien, but his wife won the, lot, won the lottery and he got to stay. And, um, you know, you had some dead people at LAX 
who paid the price for that one. Uh, you know, it, it just points up a number of things. Number one, we don't have the capacity to really do thorough background checks on people who come from completely dysfunctional countries. Yep. Uh, Uzbekistan is about as dysfunctional as you're going to get in this world. Uh, and it's virtually impossible to do the kind of background checks that are necessary to determine whether somebody poses a danger. But it also just points up the complete stupidity uh, of our whole immigration system. Uh, and stupidity may be too kind of a word. Uh, we have this system that takes most people based on who they're related to. Uh, and that wasn't working. And Ted Kennedy and Chuck Schumer recognized this back in the 1990s. But rather than go and fix the system, they came up with all kinds of harebrained schemes to try to patch over the failure of our underlying policy. So they came up with the brilliant idea of, hey, saying, let's pick 50,000 people out of a hat. Um, literally, you know, by chance, by, at random chance. Uh, we take 50,000 people into the United States. We don't really look at what they're offering to this country. Uh, this guy that you mentioned who carried out the attack in New York listed his um, his professional skills as truck driver. I mean, I guess it was useful when he mowed down a bunch of people in New York City, uh, but it really isn't a skill that is in uh, short supply here in the United States, and you know, probably one that we're not even going to need in, the few, in a few years as we move, move towards driverless vehicles, but nevertheless, he got in uh, because we have this scheme that was concocted to cover up the failure of our underlying policy, and nobody wants to recognize that and say, the whole thing is a mess. Let's scrap it and start again. Uh, and, and, you know, these are the consequences. You, have, you bring in people who have no particular use to this country, and then you can't even do the kind of background checks to make sure that they don't pose a danger to the country. A very good point. There are others. Syed Harris Ahmed, convicted of acts of terrorism in the U.S. and abroad. He got in on a, uh, one of these uh, lottery visas. We also have Musa Mohammed Abu Marzouk, a U.S.-based leader of Hamas, no less. Hamas in this country. He had to be deported for terrorist activities. How did a guy from Hamas get into the country on a, on, on a lottery visa when, as you point out, there should be uh, vetting of these people, and apparently we can't vet them coming from the Palestinian territories. Well, yeah, I mean, we just had this woman, uh, Ramze Odeh, who was finally deported. I mean, she had been convicted in Israel of a terrorist bombing that killed two people. Uh, she was released in a prisoner swap. She came to the United States, you know, lied on her application. Uh, somehow, you know, they, they missed the fact that she had a conviction for terrorism on her record. Uh, she made it all the way through the process of getting into the United States. She actually became a citizen of the United States. So, I mean, it, when you hear these government officials say, hey, there's nothing to worry about, we're doing thorough checks on everybody, uh, you know, you can take that for what it's worth. Well, you know, um, the other point I'll make is that it was by design in the prior administration of Barack Obama, uh, Tamik Ramadan, who was uh, the grandson of the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood and who had uh, been involved in uh, accusations of sexual assault against girls in the 80s and 90s, uh, was barred from coming into this country by Colin Powell, the Secretary of State. But in 2010, Hillary Clinton signed an order letting him into the country. And uh, and he was he's a terrorist. His, 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 he was then charged with four uh, with rapes of women. And his brother said, "Well, you need four men to testify that they saw the rape." Well, obviously, you're not going to have four men testify they saw the rape. So he's going to he goes scot free under Islamic law. But she signed an order, did Clinton, letting him into the country, notwithstanding all of his problems, and being the grandson of the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood. So it was by design in that administration to let these people in. It, yeah, I mean, whether a design or just sheer negligence or you know putting politics ahead of the security of the country, these things are happening. I mean, we, we saw that uh, you know what is it two years ago in San Bernardino, California. Uh, one of the shooters was a woman Malik, with yeah. Li yeah, she had lied on her application to come to the United States. She posted allegiance to her allegiance to ISIS on her Facebook page, and you know she just made her way right through the system. Again, I mean, it, it just points out the fact that all these assurances, when you hear these you know politicians saying, "Hey, we should admit more um, people from Syria as refugees," I mean, not denying that they 
they're in legitimate trouble. Uh, but, you know, when they tell you that we're going to do thorough background checks on them and nobody's going to pose a danger to the United States, there are just so many examples of people who have slipped through the system uh, who should have been flagged. I mean, some of these cases, you know, there were more red flags than a May Day parade, and they still got through. You know, uh, Jay Johnson, the Secretary of Homeland Security, by direction of Obama, we got the memo put out publicly at the time, put out a memo in which he said, do not look at the uh, social media of people coming into the country from elsewhere because that's their private stuff. So the analysts at Homeland Security were prohibited from looking at Tafshin Malik's postings bragging about being an extremist and having been involved in madrasas and all that. I mean, on top of everything else, it, 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 you know, the absurdity, when you post stuff on your Facebook page, it isn't private anymore. <laughs> You're putting it out there for everybody to see. I mean, you can't get much more public than that. We'll come right back with Ira Melman, Director of Media Relations for your calls. Six, by the way, at the Federation for American Immigration Reform, 617-266-6868. That's the number to Boston. Immigration, uh, those on the far left wanted to basically destroy the fabric of this nation. What do you make of it? At the Voice of Boston, WRKO. Back we are. Good to have you with us. 225 at the Voice of Boston, WRKO. Mike Siegel in. Let's go to your calls for Ira Melman, Director of Media Relations at the Federation for American Immigration Reform, which is fairus.org. Get over there and take a look. You should join. They're great people. Jerry on the Cape, you're on WRKO. Hello, Jerry. Good afternoon, Mike. Good afternoon, Mr. Melman. I have one statement and two questions. In Massachusetts, they reported that in calendar year 2016, we spent $2 billion on illegal aliens. That's not counting the refugees that are here. I have a question, uh, Mr. Melman. The Constitution, doesn't it state unequivocally that illegal aliens have no legal expectations to rights or privilege? privileges? They're only reserved for natural-born and naturalized citizens? Well, the Constitution doesn't specifically address illegal aliens. I mean, there are certain rights that the Constitution guarantees to anybody, irrespective of you know their legal status here in the United States. So, if you are an illegal alien and you're being charged with a crime, you're entitled to you have a constitutional right to um, legal defense. Uh, but when we're talking about entitlements, entitlements are by definition optional. Uh, you know, they're, they're optional. Local governments and the federal government can set the criteria uh, for who gets the money. And, you know, it's perfectly reasonable for them to decide that if you're in the country illegally, you should not be entitled to access to those entitlement programs. So th- there is no constitutional guarantee for anybody uh, to get access to entitlement programs, and it's perfectly reasonable under the Constitution for a local government to say, if you're in the country illegally, you're not going to get public housing or, or any of these other optional benefits. Do you appreciate the now, Thank I have you, another Jerry. question. All right, go ahead quickly. Harboring the Aliens Act, why doesn't the Department of Justice and Attorney General Jeff Sessions charge all these mayors and government officials, charge them with harboring the aliens? That's a good question. Thank you, sir. That, that would involve prosecution of the mayors. That's been talked about, Mr. Melman. Yeah, that, that has been talked about. And, you know, you'd probably have to get somebody who is more of an expert you know, in the technical matters of law than I am uh, to discuss whether that is that that can be done. But, you know, there are there is legislation out there that would hold local governments accountable if they release criminal aliens. If I says, you know, to the Boston Police Department that you have somebody in your lockup that we're interested in and, you know, the the city of Boston tells ICE to go take a hike, and you know they put this guy back out on the street, and that guy goes on to commit other crimes. Then they could potentially be subject to a lawsuit on the part of the victims if um, you know it can be shown that this was a direct re- this was a direct re- direct result of their negligence, and, and that's something that certainly should happen. It, it can and it should. There's legislation in Congress, uh, but of course it would require some leadership in Congress to actually start moving it. Yeah, and the Kate Stanley case would be a perfect example of that. Uh, Jake in Brockton, you're on WRKO with Mr. Melman. Go right ahead, Jake. Yes, good afternoon. Yep. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I thought I got cut off. The, um, the, I just want to talk about the most recent historic. If we look under the past administration when um, they had the Arab Spring, and that was supposed to be a great thing in Egypt, and you had the uprisings and whatnot. And then we got rid of that leadership, and there was chaos. And then again in Libya. So that was in, on an international level. 
And then here, when we had illegals coming through the borders, and I wanted to find a country, from my interpretation, just a simpleton, but borders and a flag equal a country. And without either of those, we would not have a country. So I would say the past administration, the enemy was within, the ultimate Trojan horse. Well, let's get, let's get the response. Thank you very much. About one minute, Mr. Bowman, go right ahead. Yeah. Well, it was not just the past administrations. This has been going on for decades here in the United States. But yeah, I mean, the, the problems are are us and our leadership. They are the you know they are responsible for the situation that we have now. Uh, you know, the, the people who are coming to the country, you know, coming to the country illegally, they're breaking the law, but they're acting in self-interest. It is our government leaders that have failed to represent the interests of the country, the interests of the American people. That has been the problem. It continues to be the problem. There's nothing wrong with our laws. We simply have had uh, successive administrations that refuse to carry them out in the interest of the American people. They forget the fact that the primary constituency for U.S. immigration policy is the American people. They are there to protect our interests, and they should be doing it. The, just wrapping up, the uh, last president to really enforce immigration law was Dwight Eisenhower back in the 50s. So there you are. Yeah, anyway. you've got to go back a ways. Mr. Melman, it's always a pleasure. Again, have a great Thanksgiving with your family. Appreciate your being on the program, and we'll talk again soon. Thanks very much. You take care. Mike Siegel here in for Jeff Cooner. Good to have you with us. If you're on the line, we'll take your calls on immigration. We'll come back also on the question of kneeling in football and the president's latest tweet. Stay with us at The Voice of Boston, WRKO. WRKO, The Voice of Boston. Here we are back with you, folks. Good to be here. Mike Siegel in for Jeff Cooner. Have a great Thanksgiving. It's been a great three days. I've enjoyed being here with all of you, and we'll wrap it up here uh, on a high note, if you will, uh, with a lot of energy, because that's what this NFL situation uh, conjures up, is a lot of energy and a lot of passion. Look, people love the National Football League. I'm one of them. And I've got to tell you that since I started using my satellite service, I won't mention the name, in 2001, every year, I have bought the NFL Sunday ticket. This year, I did buy it, and then the kneeling controversy happened, and to the credit of the satellite company, they allowed people to cancel the NFL Sunday ticket as a protest to the kneeling by the players during the national anthem. Now, the normal policy of this company is if you buy the NFL Sunday ticket, you cannot cancel it once the first game begins. You've got to keep it for the season. But they modified that, so I canceled it. I'm done. I've had it with Roger Goodell and his uh, irrational decisions. He's the same guy who decided that Ray Rice, who pounded his fiance at the time in an elevator, dragged her on the floor out of the elevator, and he gets a two-game suspension. And then, as you know, Tom Brady gets four games for deflating a football. I guess it's worse to deflate a football than it is to pound a human being into oblivion, into unconsciousness. Goodell is a complete buffoon. And he's the ultimate version of uh, somebody getting to a level of incompetence and proving that they're incompetent. I liked him when he first took over. And he's uh, year by year shown me that he's a disgrace. And he hasn't got the guts to stand up and say, you stand up during the National Anthem. Matter of fact, let me start with the NFL operations manual. Now, there's an NFL rule book. In the rule book itself, which has about uh, penalties and all of that uh, for violations of rules, there's no mention of the National Anthem. But the game operations manual, which is where it should be, in terms of the operations outside of the on-field play, in the operations manual, the game operations manual says this, regarding the National Anthem. And I'm going to quote it and read it word for word. The National Anthem must be played prior to every NFL game, and all players must be on the sideline for the National Anthem. During the National Anthem, players on the field and bench area should stand at attention, face the flag, hold the helmets in their left hand, and refrain from talking. The home team should ensure that the American flag is in good condition. It should be pointed out to players and coaches that we continue to be judged 
by the public in this area of respect for the flag and our country. Failure to be on the field by the start of the national anthem may result in discipline, such as fines, suspensions, and or the forfeiture of draft choices for violations of the above, including first offenses. I'll read one sentence again. It should be pointed out to players and coaches that we continue to be judged by the public in this area of respect for the flag in our country. So ladies and gentlemen, this debunked National Football League has already said what the President has said and what millions of people who are boycotting the National Football League have said, and that is that we need to respect the flag, and you are required to stand for the flag, and you're required to be on the field for the flag. That's the NFL's own rule in its operations manual. And this coward, this crawling coward, Roger Goodell, won't say to the players, you must follow this operations manual rule. It is absolutely unconscionable that this happens. Now, Donald Trump tweeted this morning because all of a sudden Goodell is saying, well, maybe we'll let them stay in the locker room. Well, that's cowardly, too, because the rule exists in the league. And the decency exists to stand and honor the flag and those who fought and died for that flag and became severely injured for that flag and who risked their lives for that flag and their families who had to live with that situation of their loved one facing death every day on the battlefield, fighting for the freedom of this country. You know, a guy like Michael Bennett of the Seattle Seahawks kneels, complains, and makes $8 million a year. I don't see him have suffering because of it financially. Now, he's had the opportunity in this country to make a ton of money. And he's complaining about it. And you know what? If these guys want to protest, don't protest the flag of the national anthem. Protest by going out and doing things in the community. By making it better. Many of them do start foundations, and I commend that. To help uh, kids get to college or to help in inner city problems with financial support and other ways in which they help. Building Michael Jordan, for example, just paid to build a hospital. And that's commendable. That's great. Those are the things. Malcolm Jenkins of the Philadelphia Eagles is the stalwart of what should be done as a role model. He has gone out riding with the police in their cars. These guys want to complain about the police. He's ridden with the police in their cars and talked to them and, and on their shift about the work that they do, watch their work. He's gone to the police stations and talked to the officials. He's also worked on getting a law passed in Pennsylvania. He plays for the Eagles in Philadelphia. In Pennsylvania where after 10 years a misdemeanor can be removed from your record if you've done nothing bad since the misdemeanor. Not a felony, but a misdemeanor can be extinguished from your record, expunged after 10 years of living a clean life. That helps you to get a job, and it helps you to have a clean record. He's doing things like that. But these guys are lazy. It's very easy to kneel during the National Anthem. And Colin Kaepernick, when he was out there, he was able to wear on his socks depictions of police as pigs. Goodell didn't say a word about that. But when Tim Tebow kneeled to say a quick prayer after a touchdown, man, Goodell jumped all over him when they wanted to wear 9-11 remembrances on the 15th anniversary. Goodell said no. When the Dallas Cowboys wanted to wear little decals on their helmets honoring the police who were assassinated by a sniper in Dallas, you'll remember, about a year ago, Goodell said no. But it's okay to depict the police as pigs. It's okay to dishonor the American flag. This fellow Goodell is a disgrace. And he's a liar when he says that we honor this country and, and the flag. He's a complete bald-faced liar. And the National Football League should pay the price for it. Donald Trump tweeted this this morning when Goodell said maybe we'll, the reports came out that maybe they'll have the guys stay in the locker room. Uh, the president said, the NFL is now thinking about a new idea, keeping teams in the locker room during the national anthem next season. That's almost as bad as kneeling. When will the highly paid commissioner finally get tough and smart? This issue is killing your league. End quote. 
Now, I understand, obviously, the Patriots are the icon of the football world uh, on the field, but we're not talking about on the field. We're talking about the, the basic decency to respect the flag, the anthem, what it represents, and the freedom that gave these players the opportunity to make a ton of money, far more by multiples than 95 or 99 percent of the people listening to this program right now. And they've had it good. Where else are they going to go to have it this good? I want to hear from you about this. You might disagree. You might think that the NFL is doing fine. I don't. Number to Boston is 617-266-6868. 617-266-6868. I really have had it with uh, Roger Goodell and his inane excuses for how he operates. And now they're talking about giving him $50 million a year salary? Now, they're a private organization. And certainly the NFL has the right to do that. The owners pay the salary. But is he worth $50 million? I guess maybe because he makes them a lot of money. But you know what? As these ratings continue to drop by 5 6 7% from last year, which they are dropping, as attendance continues to drop, which it is dropping around the league, and of course the mediocre teams are going to feel it more than the better teams, the bottom line is that this National Football League down the road is going to be in big trouble. Because when you combine this debacle that's been created by Roger Goodell, who should have ordered these players to stand for the flag to begin with, when this debacle has been created, it's on top of the fact that the film Concussion came out, that the book about concussions came out, that the reports about the concussions came out, that the cover-up by Pete Tagliabu, a Paul Tagliabu, and Roger Goodell, who covered it up, until he could no longer cover it up, that these concussions are serious problems. That parents are going to say, why should I let my kid play football? There's baseball, there's soccer, there's uh, all, all kinds of other sports. Who needs this? John in Uxbridge, you're on WRKO, the voice of Boston. Hello, John. Hi, Mike. Uh, happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, you yeah, too. My feeling about Goodell is, you know, he is there to protect the owners and make right. them as much money as possible. And if you have to start living by the rules and suspending players, that's taking players, premier players, uh, you know, out of out of action, and they're going to lose the money by that. So he tries to protect them as much as he can. And that's that's the only reason he's there. Yep, I agree. But you know, if you have a rule. Uh, it should be it should be enforced, and and the real the thing that really bothers me about it is that the the hypocrisy of it. I just mentioned how the Cowboys couldn't wear decals to honor the police who were killed by the assassin uh, in Dallas. Uh, Goodell wouldn't let him. They wouldn't let Tim Tebow kneel. He wouldn't let. By the way, there's another one. There was a player who wanted to wear pink shoes for the entire season because his mother died of breast cancer, and he wanted to honor her for the season. And Goodell wouldn't let him wear those. But it's okay to kneel for the national anthem. My point is that it's a hip- hypocritical duplicity, and there's a specific rule in the operations manual that I read that says you must stand for the national anthem. Yeah, but he he's the one that enforces the rules that, that he chooses to enforce. And we have the right to say, you want to play that game, uh, we have a right, as many fans are saying, we're going to walk away. Yeah, well, uh, hopefully it backfires on them, and, and I think it, it is uh, to a certain extent, and... Uh... Hopefully uh, they'll they'll finally uh, come to their senses and, and do what they're supposed to do. John, appreciate it. Great to talk to you. Happy Thanksgiving, too. Let's go to Bert and Malden. Hello, Bert. You're on The Voice of Boston, WRKO. Hey, thanks for taking my call. Listen, uh, you, you you said a little about a minute ago, you know, when's Goodell going to get, get tough about this? And the message I took was, when's he going to grow a set? i got to <laughs> say, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, uh, I'm a veteran, and uh, I... When I watched the uh, opening scene from Save It Private Ryan, I, I had to get up and leave the, the room, and I threw up in my kitchen sink because it was so horrific. And what people don't realize is the national anthem represents this country, not the individual police departments that these people have taken a stand against. And not for nothing, that national anthem represents 
the the freedoms that those people died on the beaches of Normandy for. That's the, that's the reason this flag still flies high, and the reason these football players live in the country they do. And these players, of all people, should realize what this country provides them as far as opportunities. Most of them come from ghettos, and now they're making millions of dollars. I'm a little bit nauseated by the fact that Fidel doesn't take a stand on this and, and do something about this. And, well, uh, especially you, know, you being a, a veteran, I want to thank you for your service, and, and I'm not a veteran. Uh, you are, uh, and I'm rep- repulsed by it, but I can't imagine yeah. how, how badly you, because you know you probably saw guys die around you, you know that every day in battlefields, uh, soldiers risk their lives for that flag and for that anthem, and yeah. then these guys are disparaging it. That, that's, and, to and, me, a disgrace. And I, and I understand they're upset because black men are targeted by police officers, and, and we all know that. Their racism is still alive and well in this country, and it's a sad thing, okay? And it's probably never going to go away in the history of mankind. And, I, you know, that's, a, that's an inconvenient, sad truth. But the individual police, the, the, the war that's going on with black men and, and, and police officers isn't an issue about the national anthem. And, all, and, and like I said, I don't think they, they're paid professional athletes, not paid professional politicians, and they're making a political statement. And i got to tell you, too, when, when I hear the national anthem, that last line, for the land of the free and the home of the brave, I well up. Okay, my eyes start to... Yep. Up. And when I see the, the when I see the fighter jets fly over on that opening day for the Red Sox, my skin tingles. Okay, I get all goosebumps because those F, those fighter jets represent this country. And all I'm saying, I don't want to go on a wicked rant about it, all this, but those players of all people should realize the the opportunities that this country has provided for them. And I really wish Goodell would say another another platform, another arena, another time. You take this up, but not here, not on my watch. You don't, you don't take a kneel dur- during the national anthem, and that's Thank all I'm going to say. I'm going to hang up. Thank you for your service. I appreciate it, Bert, very much. Uh, there's a veteran. 250 it is. We'll come right back to your calls at 617-266-6868, which is the number to Boston here at the Voice of Boston WRKO at 250. Stay with us. 254 in the afternoon, and a good afternoon. And again, I'll just say have a happy Thanksgiving. Uh, and again, I'll just remind you, I do a weekly column for WRKO.com. Hope you take a look at it. This week it's about uh, Roy Moore and Al Franken. And uh, if you want to take a look at a, what I think is a great read on talk radio, it's called Airing the Wave, book I wrote about talk radio, my experiences in this field, and the power of talk radio to make policy and change policy, Airing the Wave. And if you want to pick it up at Barnes & Noble's website or Amazon or any of the others, That'd be great. I think you'll enjoy it. Tony in Weymouth, you're on WRKO, the voice of Boston. Hello, Tony. Good afternoon. Thank you for taking my call. I'll definitely uh, check out that book. That sounds like a good read. Thank you very much. Hey, listen, um, about this Goodell thing, you know, it's it's all about the integrity of the game itself for this guy. You know, I remember how he came after Brady over the small little thing of uh, the weight of the uh, actual football yep. versus yep. people taking knees during the national anthem. You know, these, these athletes, they do it at such a safe time, they take that knee. Let's see one of these guys take a knee before they catch the touchdown pass. That would show me some real bravery. Yeah, I, by the way, uh, uh, th- that's a great point. But the other point is, he gives Tom Brady four games for deflating a football, if he did. And he gives Ray Rice two games for pounding the hell out of his fiance so that she's unconscious and then drags her out of the elevator. We saw that on the video. Right. That's, it that's two in, games. It doesn't include the integrity of the game. For You know, it doesn't ruin the game. It doesn't lower the rating, so he doesn't care. Well, you know, uh, how has it affected your the way you look at the NFL now in terms of your own support for the NFL? Honestly, you know, I, I, I go with the tides of the way that our teams are going, and right now I'm just a huge Celtics fan, and I'm not even paying attention to the NFL, to be honest. Fifteen straight. That's pretty amazing. It's it's pretty incredible. They're going for sixteen and seventeen against the Magic. Let me tell you. You know, um, since you brought that up, I when I was a kid, I remember Bob Cousy and Bill Sharman and Jim Luskatoff and uh, I mean uh, the the whole the whole crowd of of that incre- Sam Jones, Casey Jones. Um, I mean, it was an amazing team, and the, the Celtics have a great history. 
and tradition. Then, of course, uh, went on tough times. Now, uh, this is an amazing run. Do you, th- you think they have a shot at beating Cleveland in the Eastern Division? You know, I'd, I'd, I'd love to see them go up against uh, uh, LeBron with the team mindset because I think that LeBron is a guy that tries to take it all on his own shoulders. And, uh, you know, the coaching this year and the, uh, the Celtics and in prior years, I mean, he's really setting them up for just a, a good, solid, formulaic team. And I, I like it a lot. I like watching this basketball team. Yeah, they're great. They're doing a great job, too. Listen, Tony, have a great Thanksgiving. Thanks for calling. Happy too. Thanksgiving. You take care. Um, yeah, it's in, the Celtics are great, they're great fun now. And um, maybe that's a diversion from football. Um, and, of course, obviously the Patriots are doing, as expected, very, very well. And it's it's an, an interesting time, but I uh, I think there's a, a point at which you have to say I put my so-called money where my mouth is. I put my principle into action, and for me that's what happened. Um, you know, loving the National Football League as I have over the years, as well as baseball. Baseball is actually my favorite, but the NFL has always been exciting. And having the ability to watch all of the games on a Sunday over the years has been something I've always looked forward to. Because uh, you have, uh, the way the satellite company does it, they have uh, eight boxes on the screen. And they have eight games, eight different games there, so you can watch them all at once. Uh, and, and then you can just click on whatever game you want to watch on the full screen. Well, I got rid of it this year, after this kneeling controversy started. And I think the president's right on point with his tweet that Goodell has to get some guts somewhere because it's going to continue. There are there are hardcore NFL fans that are going to be there no matter what. But there are those people who are going to say, uh, look, uh, this, is, this is becoming uh, too nonsensical, too irrelevant, too meaningless, and, uh, this, and uh, uh, for me, I'm not going to uh, participate in this thing. Uh, there has to be some value and meaning. You know, when Goodell says that uh, they honor the military and they honor this country, he's full of it. Because when you honor, you, it's not you can't just say the words; you have to do it by deed. And it's time. And look, well, look what Jerry Jones did in Dallas. He told his entire player roster, "If you kneel during the national anthem, you're not playing." If you kneel during the national anthem with that disrespect, you're not getting paid. We're suspending you. And the league has a rule that I just read that it refuses to follow. Why does the rule exist? You know, we've become a nation of convenience for rules and regulations, like illegal immigration we talked about earlier. And that's tragic. In any event, it's been great to be here for these three days. Have a great Thanksgiving. Hopefully we'll talk again sometime in the future. And uh, I look forward to having a great weekend myself. As always, be good to yourself in the world, and the world will be good to you at The Voice of Boston, WRKO. Thanks for being with us. The Voice of Boston is you. 680 WRKO Boston, 93.7 WEEI HD2 Lawrence, Boston. It's 3 o'clock.